Money makes the world go round. The world go round. The world go round. Or so they say. But it's equally true the other way. In today's ultra-connected global markets, money goes around the world, seeking out the potential trades. If you're getting started in trading, that can seem a bit daunting. Is it better to trade the FTSE, the CAC, the DAX, or the US markets? What currencies are going up, and what are they going up against? Yet being able to trade such a wide range of assets from a single screen can be a huge advantage. After all, there's always a bull market somewhere. So join me, Galaxy Brain Investors, as we head around the world in seven trades. I'm here in New York, home of the world's largest stock market and center of the world's largest economy. America accounts for around one quarter of global GDP, which helps explain the old adage, when Wall Street sneezes, the world catches a cold. But how do we know if the US has the sniffles? There are three main American stock benchmarks. There's the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the oldest by far at almost 140 years, but also the narrowest. Then there's the S&P 500, which is the broadest and was created in the 1960s. It's perhaps the best barometer for the US market as a whole, but in many ways, it's the NASDAQ that's told us more about the US economy for the last decade or so. It tracks the stocks that are listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange, which is different from the New York Stock Exchange and has a heavy bias towards the tech sector. In the 2010s, and especially after the pandemic, the NASDAQ boomed. It's up by more than 400% in the past decade. Will it continue to outstrip the Dow and the S&P in the years ahead? Or will the older sectors start to drive the US economy once again? The relative performance of these indices will tell us a lot about what's going on, and this may offer ways to trade these shifts. We're still in America for our second trade. Behind me is the Federal Reserve, the US central bank, and in many ways, the seat of America's financial power. Nothing better demonstrates the global dominance of the US and the financial trust that investors place in it than the US Treasury bond. The 10-year Treasury has been seen as the ultimate investment safe haven. It's where everybody has rushed when trouble hits the market, not just in America, but around the globe. Treasuries are issued by the government, specifically the US Treasury, not by the Federal Reserve. But it's the credibility of the Federal Reserve when it comes to maintaining the stability of the financial system or controlling inflation that plays a crucial role in ensuring that investors continue to trust them. And that's why, when the chair of the Federal Reserve speaks, markets listen. And now it's time for us to head over the Atlantic. In many ways, London's markets have shrunk in importance over the decades since the US displaced Britain as the world's financial superpower. But there's still at least one area which it retains an outsized importance, currency trading. London is the world's FX trading hub with a market share of around 40%. Currency trading involves going long one currency and going short another. Take the US dollar against the British pound currency pair, which is known in the business as cable. The name dates back to the 19th century when the exchange rate between the two began being transmitted through the first transatlantic submarine cables. Although exchange rates have changed a bit since then, I need 100 US dollars. That will be 20 pounds. Cable is a very good example of how FX trading in major pairs works. The US dollar has been a safe haven and has tended to do well in times of trouble. The pound has been much more cyclical and has been buffeted much more in a crisis. And talking of being buffeted, Bit breezy, isn't it? We're still in the UK. Just about. I'm on an oil platform in the North Sea. The production of oil here in the 1970s transformed the global energy markets, but it's not even in the top 10 oil producers these days. The US, Saudi Arabia and Russia dominate oil production with more than 40% of output. Despite that, the benchmark for global oil prices is still Brent crude which was originally named after and extracted from the Brent field, but is now a basket of oil from several North Sea fields. When oil is traded, it's often priced with reference to Brent, 
at a premium or discount depending on the type of oil, taking into account factors such as how dense it is and how much sulfur it contains. Brent is the benchmark for around two thirds of global oil supplies. Let's go somewhere a little more relaxing. This is better. We're in Paris on the Champs Elysees, the epitome of French luxury and beauty. We're here because this provides a very good example of how concentrating too much on the US can lead investors astray. American markets have greatly outperformed the rest of the world for the past decade or so, but that doesn't mean there haven't been opportunities elsewhere. Many European companies have done very well, even if the overall market hasn't shone. And nothing shows that better than French luxury goods makers. They boomed on the back of rising demand, especially from newly wealthy buyers in emerging markets. That's why LBMH is one of the world's most valuable companies, and its founder, Bernard Arnault, has been battling it out with Elon Musk for the title of the world's richest man. It's also why the Paris Stock Exchange has overtaken London as Europe's most valuable stock market. Should we check out a bit of bling? Hey, this isn't what I meant. It seems I've ended up in a hole in the ground in South Africa. What used to be in this hole was a lot of gold. Until relatively recently, South Africa was the world's biggest gold producer. Back in the 1960s and 70s, it was responsible for two thirds of global supply. These days, production has declined and there are quite a lot of countries ahead of it. But all that South African gold is still out there in jewelry or bank vaults or wherever. That's the interesting thing about gold. Unlike a lot of stuff we dig out the ground, it doesn't really get used up and it's not especially scarce compared to some other elements. So why do we put such a high value on it? Perhaps because of that, it doesn't corrode. It doesn't tarnish. It doesn't have that many industrial uses. And there's enough of it if we're prepared to pay the cost of mining it without being so much that the market is easily glutted. Those features make it a very good metal to use as a store of wealth. If you've been counting, you'll know that's six trades. So what's the seventh? Right here in front of your trading screen. There's a broad range of investment themes out there to be discovered. We've just scratched the surface with our tour. You can go long or short thousands of shares in all the world's major markets, track key indices such as the FTSE and the Dow by buying exchange traded funds, take a view on commodities through current spot prices or futures contracts in the months ahead, and trade all the major currencies against one another. But just because you can trade everything doesn't mean you should. Trading is about getting to know a market, what drives it, and what the risks are. You can check all that's available on capital.com. But before you do, here's a few things we've seen on our global tour. There are a vast range of assets trading around the world. Traders should think globally. Markets are driven by a range of different trends. When one's going down, another's going up. Trading indiscriminately will lose you money. Do your research and find your edge. And on that note, I'm off to do a bit of research into orange juice futures. Not quite what I was expecting. This is better. Waiter, I'll have two more of these with a splash of vodka.